Hi, I'm Darren Morton and thanks for joining me. In this first episode of Happiness by Design, we're going to study this state we call happiness. What is it and how do we go about grasping it? Recently I interviewed some folk to find out their impressions. Happiness comes to me when I see good outcomes from things I've invested a lot in. What brings me most happiness in life is to be lost in the moment. God does. I feel most happy when I feel free, free of responsibility, although responsibility actually brings me fulfilment, so it's like an odd thing. There is good food, there is discovering things, there is getting a contract from a publisher, but my biggest happiness probably comes from my family. I love to be with my wife. Spending time with my family. What brings you the greatest happiness? Mate, the thing that brings me the greatest happiness is spending quality time with my friends. Musical worship. I love it. So what makes you happy? Laughing till I'm going to be sick. <laughs> I think what makes me happy is um, just loving my friends and family and having them love me back. Greatest happiness, my children, my family, my dogs, my house and uh, having a job that involves making a difference. In truth, we all pursue happiness. You know, we all want to be happy. We even like happy stories. I mean, none of us, uh, when we're reading a book and we turn to those final pages and it concludes with, and they all have lived happily ever after. No one sort of puts the book down and goes, oh, what? That's sort of, you know, not what I was after. We all want happiness. However, the sad reality is that for many of us, that's not what we're experiencing in our lives. I read an, uh, an interview recently with a, a famous Hollywood star, and uh, in that interview they said, I do not know one person who is truly happy. Now that to me is a tragedy. That's a tragic situation. So what is happiness and how can we our own? Well, fascinatingly enough, despite our great interest in happiness and all of us wanting to be happy, very little research attention has been dedicated to, to this phenomenon. And it's only in recent times, in the last decade or so, that psychologists have started to really invest their energies into understanding what it's all about. The man spearheading the assault on researching happiness is, uh, is former um, president of the American Psychological Association, Dr. Martin Seligman. Now, Dr. Martin Seligman is a, is a, a, a confessed pessimist, well, a reformed pessimist, I should say, and he's been instrumental in, in leading what we refer to now as the po positive psychology movement. And it was interesting at the time when, uh, when Dr. Seligman was, was made uh, president-elect of the American Psychological Association, he, he was to choose a theme for his, uh, his presidency, for his period, period of presidency. And uh, he was scratching, he said, what can I do? What can, we, what can I spend, vest our efforts in? Where should we move our association? And it was uh, through a fortuitous scolding of his, uh, of his young daughter who said that he should stop being such a grouch. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had your young child give you such a comment. But uh, after a scolding like that, he thought, do you know what? I think she's onto something. And so he actually set about studying this state that we call happiness and his, his research that uh, is fascinating. What he's discovered is A, what brings happiness, but more to the point, what doesn't bring or guarantee happiness. And let's start with that. What is it that people often pursue in the hope of uh, experiencing happiness but don't quite get there? Well, number one, money. You know, I've heard the, the saying, all I ask for in life is the opportunity to prove that riches won't corrupt me and bring me happiness. Well, few of us seem to be presented with that opportunity, but what the research indicates is that it is indeed true. Money does not guarantee happiness. It's true we need the basics met. It's hard to be cheery when the rain's pouring on your head because you don't have a shelter over it and your, your tummy's screaming at you because uh, of the hunger pains. But it seems that by and large once those basics have been met, we, our level of happiness doesn't necessarily uh, increase uh, any further. For example, the upper class don't necessarily report higher levels of happiness than working class individuals. And in the same way, if we look at the, the level of affluence in the United States, it's, it's more than doubled in the past 50 years, and yet the reported levels of people's happiness has not increased substantially at all. In fact, in some pockets, it's actually gone down. So what we can conclude is that money and finances do not guarantee happiness, contrary to popular belief. 
What else doesn't guarantee happiness? Well, marriage. Now, the data on this is quite interesting. What the studies suggest is that around that sort of courting, uh, that wedding period, uh, there is an upward deflection in people's levels of happiness. I have no idea what that might be responsible, may be responsible for that, but what they indicate is that soon after, within six months or so, people's levels of happiness tends to uh, come back to their baseline or their premarital, premarital state. Uh, what we can conclude from that is that mar marriage doesn't necessarily guarantee that people are going to be happier. And in fact, you know, given that in, in today's climate, about one in two marriages ends in divorce, it would actually indicate that um, in some instances, relationships have the capacity to negate or detract from our level of happiness. Certainly what, we, what seems to be the case is that relationships have the ability to magnify our emotions and, and how we feel. So if the good is there, well then the good gets all the better. But if that's a miserable relationship, often it can make it all the worse. I often say uh, I've been married for 13 years and they've been 13 of the happiest years of my wife's life. She doesn't like me saying that, but I say it anyway. It's been good times for me too. Um, so what we can say is that marriage doesn't get guarantee happiness. On the flip side, however, when people are asked the question, what brings them the greatest joys in their life, often they report things that relate to relationships. For example, children is usually top of the list. And so obviously relationships uh, have the opportunity to boost our level of, um, of happiness, but they don't necessarily guarantee it. So if money doesn't guarantee it, marriage doesn't guarantee it, what does? Well, it's not even career, as Dr. Seligman indicates. Often we, we look at people, we think, oh, if we had that job, well then that would be wonderful and I'd be happy 24 seven, but that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, what the research indicates is that it's not the work we do, but it's what it means to us. And I had an interesting experience with this when I was working my way through university. And uh, each, during each break period I would go and I, I had a job in a warehouse where I would do this what I thought was a fairly mundane kind of task. I'd tick a little mark and then I'd put a certain amount of packages for a particular store. And I would, the first four hours or so, I would sort of be into this task, but pretty soon I'd get a bit tired of it and I'd be looking around for other challenges and I just got to the point after about a week of this that I would hate getting up in the morning. I was ready for a change. I despised this place that I had to go to in my break. And uh, one particular afternoon, the foreman called us all up to, the, to one of the loading docks and uh, then he proceeded to bring one gentleman out the front and he said, well, uh, I would like, we've got a special announcement today because uh, I have um, Frank here with me, although his name wasn't Frank. And uh, he said, uh, Frank's been with us now for 35 years and we'd like to reward his, uh, his contribution to this, this company. 35 years, I nearly had a heart attack on the spot. I thought, how could anyone put up with this for like 35 days, let alone 35 years? And uh, I was a bit puzzled about this. He seemed quite happy and thought, well, here's an odd thing. So I went up to, uh, to Frank a little later and said, so 35 years, hey? Um, well, you enjoy it? And he looked at me and with a genuine smile, he goes, I love it. He said, I love it, love coming here each day. He said, you know, over the time we've been able to make that change and we've done this. And it soon occurred to me that he genuinely was happy here. Why? Because that was his thing. And he was invested in it, he was engaged in it. And, uh, and for him, that was a great source of happiness. And the interesting thing, he turned to me at the end, he said, so, so I notice you're only here from time to time. What, what are you here for? I said, oh, well, I'm at university studying and this is just, you know, I come during my breaks. And he said, oh, so what are you studying to, to be? And I said, oh, I'm studying to be a teacher. And he went, oh, like this, and he nearly coughed on his words. And he said, a teacher? He said, are you crazy? He said, you're gonna have to like deal with kids. And now for me, that was the draw card. For him, it was utterly repulsive. And so the point is this, it's not what you do that determines your level of happiness. It's what it means to you that's the significant thing. So the take home message from psychology is that money doesn't guarantee happiness, marriage and relationships don't guarantee happiness, and career, what we do, doesn't guarantee happiness other, uh, either. So the question remains, what does guarantee happiness. What is happiness? How can we make it our own? Stay tuned and after the break we'll flesh it out a bit further.
Welcome back. Before the break, we discussed the things that are not guaranteed to bring you happiness. And they were money, marriage and relationships, and career. So what does bring happiness? Well, the preeminent researcher in this area, Dr. Martin Seligman, father really of the positive psychology movement, has categorised happiness up into three domains, or if you like, three levels, because he actually suggests that there is superficial levels to happiness, and then there is the deeper ones. At the most superficial, at the top of the hierarchy, he says the first type of happiness is pleasure. Pleasure, happiness. Now, I don't care who you are, we like to laugh. You know, to laugh is fun. To laugh is pleasurable. But the sad reality with pleasure, happiness, is that pleasure is never permanent. Laughter is never limitless. I mean, even the, the most side-splittingly funny joke, if someone tells you the first time you have a good old chuckle and you, know, you beg them to stop because your tummy feels like you've just done a thousand sit-ups, but then when they tell you the second time, yeah, it's sort of lost its impact and then eventually it wanes away. I can think of one particular experience where I had one of those awkward moments of being in full public and not being able to hold back the laughter. It was, it was on uh, my brother and, and I, we had our debut performance in a, in a play, uh, a little church play, and I, uh, I recall this experience. We were only young. I wasn't even given a speaking part because they recognised the depth of my talent. But uh, my job was to stand at the front of the church there and, uh, and we were clothed in the... Uh, you know, with a, it's mandatory essentially for a for a church play to have those sort of sheets with the light blue and light pink lines through them, and so we had these on our heads like togas, and we're standing there, and I was just standing at the front, and I, like I said, I was just a prop, just a, an extra there, and my brother had to to run from the back, and and he had to call out to the people at the front, and uh, and I can tell you, I still have this this clear visual of my brother coming around the the back, running down between these pews, and and I should point out here that the uh, the pews had these nice big wooden uh, handles, armrests on the side. And I remember as my brother came running down saying his lines, it was a beautiful thing. His, these, these gowns were flowing behind him, it looked like something out of Chariots of Fire. Until one of those big hanging arm pieces managed to catch on the, the handle of the seats of one of those pews. And I remember my brother just halfway through sentence and halfway through stride, all of a sudden being arrested somewhat in his progress. And, and as uh, I have this, this firm visual image of, of him making this, this sort of choking sound and then his feet sort of appearing in front of us as he's, they were brought up to about head level and then bang as my brother hit the floor in between these pews. And of course being the sympathetic uh, brother that I am, I couldn't help myself but just laugh and laugh and laugh. And I remember the, uh, the, the lady there, that uh, our church organiser who'd put together this play and invested so much of her time and effort and energy into it, just looked at me and was doing this, doing this, but I just couldn't stop it. It was just so funny. And then my brother got up and then it sort of, it was contagious. And next thing, the whole thing was a, was a write-off. And you know what, when I, I reflect on that experience, I, it was one of those times where I just could not stop laughing. And even now I sort of have a giggle about it, but it wears off, it wears off. Laughter is never limitless. And what Dr. Seligman has concluded is that if our happiness is based on pleasure, then we're destined for discontent. It will come to an end at some point in time. What we need, if we want to be truly happy, is a deeper level. And that deeper level, he refers to as engagement. So at the most superficial, we have pleasure, then we move to engagement. What does engagement mean? Well, engagement can be summed up by the studies of another happiness researcher. And this man's name is Dr. Cheek Sent Me High. Now, I imagine that uh, with a name like that, you probably couldn't, end, couldn't help but end up researching happiness because I'm sure that he brings much joy to many people when he introduces himself. But Dr. Cheek sent me high, did some fascinating studies where he would put a buzzer on people. And throughout the course of the day, he would just randomly buzz this thing. And what they had to do is pull out a little log book that he'd given them and write down just what they were doing and how into it they were. And what he found, not surprisingly, is that those people that were into the things that they did and spent a large portion of their time consumed with it, immersed in that particular activity, they were ones who reported higher levels of happiness than others. 
And what he, what he concluded from that is that engagement, you know, is, is, is such a foundational thing to our happiness. And in fact, people would rather be engaged than they have, have engagement pleasure, uh, sorry, engagement happiness than pleasure happiness because it's a deeper level and it's more long lasting. It's not as sifting and shifting as is the, the, the pleasure kind of happiness. What's the take home message from that? I would encourage you and say to you that what you do, spend as much time as you can doing things that you're engaged in. And given the fact that we spend so much time in our workplace, I would say to you, you need to be engaged in the work that you, that, that you have. It's just so important. You know, you consider it. If you're working eight hours a day, if you're lucky, many of us are doing more than that. If you're working eight hours a day, that's a third of your life if you don't take holidays into consideration. If you consider that you actually sleep eight hours a day, it's really half of your waking time you spend at work. You need it, you owe it to yourself to find something that you're engaged in. Engagement is a deeper form of happiness than is pleasure alone. But Dr. Seligman has been able to, to demonstrate that there is even a deeper level of happiness again. And this is the least transient happiness. It's the happiness that really supplies us with a permanency. You know, a, a type of happiness that doesn't change depending on whether we're having a good or a bad day. And it's not pleasure happiness, the most superficial. It's not um, engagement. He refers to it as meaning. And what is meaning? Well, Dr. Seligman says that those people that have a sense of belonging to something bigger than themselves and to be part of that and contribute to, part to, to that. These are the people that seem to have this base level happiness which survives, as I said, the, the, the events and the circumstances that throw at us. So what can we conclude? There are three levels of happiness. Pleasure happiness, then engagement happiness, and last of all, meaning happiness. If we want to experience true, long-lasting happiness, it's this deeper level that we should be going after. And so how can we do that? Well, stay tuned. Join me after the break to find out how. When we reflect on the, the findings of modern science and what it's been telling us about this state we call happiness, the fact that there are these three levels, at the most superficial level, pleasure, in the middle, a slightly deeper, is engagement, and then at the deepest level is this notion of meaning. We actually see that this is the story that the Bible's actually been telling us for millennia. In fact, when we reflect on it in this way, the Bible's been telling us a lot about how we can go about achieving happiness, authentic happiness, if you like, in our lives in a very real and meaningful way. It says stuff about pleasure. Uh, and the one that probably wrote the most, the, the author of the Bible, in the Bible, who wrote the most about pleasure, is that of Solomon. Now, Solomon's a fascinating story. And uh, one of the books he wrote is the book of Ecclesiastes, which, which many people don't like. But for me, it's actually my favourite book, or one of my favourite books, because it tells the, the interesting story of a guy who had the lots, absolutely the lot. This guy is renowned for, for having great wisdom, although he didn't seem to exercise it too well. Uh, great wealth, tremendous wealth, even to, in today's standards, they talk about the notoriety of Solomon. Uh, he had um, relationships, lots and lots of relationships, believe me. He had achievement. He had all of these things going for him. And yet it says in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes that what he really set about doing was dedicating himself to pleasure. And he went about it wholeheartedly. And what the interesting thing with Solomon is at the end of it all, right, where he's going as hard as he can, you know, not leaving any stone unturned in the pursuit of pleasure, we find a gentleman in his old age, empty, bit bitter, probably a little bit twisted, I would imagine, too, just because he recognised that pleasure is not where it's at. It's interesting. One of the quotes that he said goes like this. Take the light in each light-filled hour, remembering that there will also be many dark days. And they were the words that Solomon penned. 
and is true. And I think that what we need to recognise is that pleasure's great. You know, it's worthwhile. Go for it. Enjoy life. I'm not deriding it at all. I'm all for pleasure. I think it's a fantastic construct. Go for it. Enjoy yourself. I think God has given us life. He's given us so many things that we can experience and encounter in life. He wants us to delight in it and we should set about doing that. But we need to be real as well and recognize that in life there are going to be times, there are going to be circumstances when that pleasure will evaporate. And if we are in a situation where our sense of happiness, our sense of wholeness is packaged only around the pleasure that we're experiencing, then our happiness will go with that pleasure when it, when it does. So, first message, enjoy life. Enjoy the things, the opportunities that you have, but recognise in a very real way that pleasure is not permanent. So, at a deeper level, engagement. Well, the Bible has something to say about that as well. One of my favourite quotes, this is from Galatians, from the message paraphrase, it says this, Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given, and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Now, I, I love that quote. That is a, a mantra. In fact, I have that uh, uh, in a cutout and it's on the front of my office door so that my students can read that and see that. You know, take, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given. And I like what that implies. It implies that we've all been given a work. You know, we have something to do. We have a purpose. We have a plan. God has something set aside for you. And our job is to, is to find what that is. You know, to make a careful exploration of our talents, of our, our abilities, the things that we have available to us. And then get creative and set about trying to make them work in a positive way. Uh, and in doing that, we will find a level of um, engagement that, uh, that is just so rewarding and it allows for the development of a happiness that is far more permanent than the, uh, than the pleasure variety. And I like how that, that quote, uh, just to, to, to finish off that, that quote also says, don't compare yourself with others. You know, we need to just, this is our work, this is what we've been given and then set about achieving it. And then last of all, the Bible has something to say about meaning, which is the most deepest, the deepest la layer of happiness. It says this, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. You see, meaning is about being part of something bigger than ourselves and contributing to that. And that's what Dr. Seligman says, and that's what the Bible's been telling us for a long time as well. I picked up an article, a Time magazine, a little while back. It was in the 2005 edition, and it was all on happiness. And, uh, and as I flicked through the pages, I thought, here's an interesting read. And I saw that one of the particular articles asked the question, the headline was, does God want us to be happy? And at first read, I thought, what a silly question, of course. But then I realized that, hey, from the perspective of some people, maybe they think he doesn't. But what I want to say to you is that God is interested in your happiness, but he's less concerned with the pleasure happiness, the superficial kind, and he's more concerned with the deeper levels of meaning. That's what he wants for you. Meaning in your life, engagement in your life, and that's what I want for you as well. You know, in this series, Happiness by Design, we're fleshing out this notion of happiness and what it is all about and how to go about doing it. I hope you can join us next time when we look deeper into your brain and understand the anatomy of happiness. I'm Darren Morton, reminding you to delight in God's design.